Between 2008 and 2014, Borders Rugby TV used to broadcast coverage of rugby in the south of Scotland. Well, seven years on, it's back. Hello and welcome to a special relaunch show for Borders Rugby Television and in it we'll go round the grounds talking with coaches and players but let's begin by telling you what you can expect from us this season. Every Monday to Friday we'll be bringing you the latest news on Borders Rugby as well as special interviews and features throughout the day. Our website is bordersrugby.net and we're also available on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at Borders Rugby, so accessing our content couldn't be easier. Every Thursday at 7 o'clock we'll bring you Borders Rugby in Focus, where we'll be looking back at the weekend just gone, looking forward to the weekend's games and discussing all matters relating to Borders Rugby with our pundits and guests. On Saturday nights at 9 o'clock we'll be pulling out all the stops to cover every game involving Borders teams at all levels in our Borders Rugby results roundup with action reports and reaction. And then on Sundays at 3 o'clock you can enjoy extended highlights and commentary from one of the region's top games the day before. And we have a quality team lined up to bring you all the news, a good mix of youth and experience. And let's meet one of them now, Stuart McFarlane, who's become a very familiar voice on BBC Radio Scotland as their number one rugby commentator, and also now working for Premier Sports Television. I think that the last 15 months we've been doing a lot of looking back as, as well as looking forward, and it's difficult to know what to expect in the immediate future, but you want to get back to something like we've experienced in the past, where border clubs have contested domestic semi-finals and finals to win championships, they've won promotions, they've enjoyed great occasions at Murrayfield, and, and if we can get back to something like that in the, the not-too-distant future, then I think it's going to be hugely beneficial to everybody. Now, of course, you've uh, been covering uh, rugby in the borders, radio borders, for, for a long, long time. And, uh, and in more recent times, you, you work with the BBC. You were uh, lucky enough to get out to the World Cup at Japan, which was a great experience. And, of course, you were the, the voice behind the 38-all at Twickenham. Um, that must have been quite a proud moment for you. Yes, it was. I'm, I, I have to confess it. It was. It was one of those moments where you pinch yourself. And, and in the second half, when Scotland were on the rampage and producing the the most incredible comeback, you're, you're sitting thinking. You're, you, you've moments in the game, little snatches where you think this is the, going to be the subject of a a million pub conversations. You know, this this is uh, set apart from from anything else that you'd witnessed in a venue or even on the on the television. So you were aware of the magnitude as you were describing the action and you wanted to try and deliver the very best that you, you could because it was such an iconic game, you know, the, the nature of the match, you know, how it was a, a very much a Jekyll and Hyde Scottish performance, uh, but it's, it's one that's almost going to overshadow everything else, even a more recent victory at Twickenham because there was nobody in the stadium and the players couldn't, you know, absorb that incredible atmosphere in England's back garden and use that to, to good effect as they did in the second half that day. The great thing for me is we're seeing these people before they become famous and, and you can track them back. I mean, there's the famous footage of Stuart Hogg as a 15-year-old playing for Hoyk YM and then being borrowed by Hoyk and uh, changing jersey to the green jersey at the Berwick Sevens as a 15-year-old a and Rory Sutherland playing both for Hoyk and for Gala and, of course, Darcy Graham playing for Hoyk Wanderers. And I think this is one of the great things is that we're going to be able to do is come down to clubs like here in Duns, which is, is a place you know very, very well, of course, and hopefully, you know, this is going to give them an opportunity as well to uh, to know that they're going to be filmed and and we'll go on to better things. Yeah, you do wonder uh, what what will happen to the the talent of the future. Are they going to be scooped up into a pathway system and how much time will they be given playing on the seventh circuit or playing for a club? But I, I think that has been enormously beneficial, even a few matches for the, the players that you mentioned and and being able to to work with you know enthusiastic amateur players uh, who 
themselves can give a great education in the importance of the game and the importance of wearing your town jersey, for instance. And as, as you mentioned, an, another try, when you were talking about Stuart Hogg, was, was being at Netherdale and watching him score one of, one of the best tries he's, he's probably produced in his career. You know, when, when you think of, of how he tore through the, the English defence. So you, you look at it and you think, you know, it, it is it's, it's a, a great opportunity to look at future talent, uh, to identify, but also, I think, to appreciate the longevity of a lot of players that season after season come out and will play for their club and, depending on what level they play at, will maybe stack up a, a number of winners' medals in, in different competitions, maybe win a few uh, club international caps as well. And while they've they're never been a fully-fledged professional player, they've still enjoyed a, a very fruitful career at that particular level you look as well at the, the exposure you know because ultimately everybody that's involved in this particular line wants the, the clubs and the individuals to be as professional as possible you don't want to take any of the fun element away from playing the game of course you don't but you want you know as as polished and as good an experience from the pitch to the coming in to the numbering of the, the players in the back so it's easily it's visible for spectators and particularly for us as commentators can be a, a bit of a, a bugbear if it's difficult to make out the numbers in the jerseys that team sheet information is accurate not just for the referee but for people reporting on the game because understandably if people are, are watching highlights or are listening into the radio and they know that their, their, their son or their daughter is playing and we don't have the, the the same information that they believe is is correct. That can be a you know a bit, a bit of an issue, and also the an announcements in grounds are, are clear. The information is given on a regular basis and things like that. So all all these things can help. I mean, it's something that we maybe think about because it's important to us in the media because we're instant. We're talking about the here and now, whether it's describing the action or on social media providing updates. You want those updates to be accurate. And these sort of little tweaks, and they're not difficult to do, but it's amazing how a team sheet can disappear into a changing room and it can be handed in by some of the greatest minds in the world and it comes back out again and it's never correct. You know, and, and it's, it's, we've all it's just, that, we've, we've we? all experienced that, and, it, and it is, it's, it's, it's frustrating, but it's, it's not something that, that is difficult. But it's, it's just the attention to detail with things like that that can make an enormous difference, even for a few individuals that are there, like the clubs, to provide a, a service and, and to promote the game. So we've got some uh, really good people, uh, Bruce Aitchison, Bruce Miller and Dale Clancy and uh, young Ewan Welsh and a few others as well, uh, and yourself. But of course, we're delighted that you're going to be doing the very first uh, commentary match on a 15s game uh, to kick us off on September the 4th, a premiership match, which is uh, a local derby. Can't be much better than this for a starter. Jed Forrest against Selkirk. Fraser Harkness has agreed to come in and be a pundit. And also a referee's point of view from Kelly Mitchell, who'll be uh, joining you as well so we're, we're all looking forward to that the fact that you, you mentioned there you know some experienced uh, people but fresh voices and fresh faces and, and fresh opinions to be expressed over the course of the season that is that is very important and you've got a, a lot of sort of very talented and I think very honest people behind the microphone as well I'm not including myself in that it, the, the people that you mentioned and there's, there's there's several others and it is it's a great opportunity for for everybody to to get involved to just share their views and thoughts and and look at ways of you know promoting and, and talking honestly and openly about the season as as it unfolds and of course there's great expectations on uh, a lot of aspects of the game and we just hope that they all come to fruition well, it's going to be fascinating, as you say. We'll be talking to uh, your fellow commentator, Dale Clancy, later on in the programme. But right now, let's put the focus on the players themselves and the clubs. And we'll start at the Super 6 with the head coach, Rob Christie. It's going to be interesting once we get back up and running. You know, people are asking, how are the squad looking? I said, well, yeah, they look great because they've just been training against nobody. And, you know, you've been kind of limited in what you've been allowed to do. So everybody looks great. So... Look, everybody's probably a little bit apprehensive and they don't really know where they sit. Um, but look, we are very much looking forward to it. And, and, you know, it is just great to get the game back up and running and get these young players playing as well as old players, the older players that, that really want to drive this and, and I suppose try and create something quite special. 
The Premiership, like all other leagues, ended abruptly before the playoffs, so everything's been rebooted, and we go again with Hoik, Selkirk and Jed Forrest from the Borders involved. So at the moment we've got a lot of really good young guys coming up, um, so a lot of guys stepping up from Hoik Youth, um, so there's a few of those that are going to be coming up with this team. We've got young Stanger, uh, obviously quite a well-known uh, name within Hoik, and we've got a few of the other younger guys. We'll see them coming about, but we just want to try and get them back in it because unfortunately they've missed their last year of semi-junior. So they would usually have that to transition, but they're just getting chucked in at the deep end and we'll just see if whether they will help them as much as possible to swim. We'll give them armbands and help them along as much as possible. But, um, so a lot of the older guys are staying in, a lot of people have retired, a lot of people have um, came away from rugby. Um, but they, we've still got a good squad at the moment and we're, we're just desperate to get back into it, get back going. We've got to be aiming towards that border derby on the 4th of September down at Riverside Park and start the season the way that everybody wants to start the season. We've got no doubt it's going to be tough, um, you know, so we've got to be prepared for that. But we can't overlook the fact that we want to get some valuable Kings of the Sevens points as well um, and have it best of both ways. So we've, we've, weighed, we've weighed it up. We'll obviously look nearer, obviously August the 7th is getting close with what we do at Peebles because we play Melrose on the Thursday night and we've, we've got to get something out of that as well to then back that up and go to Hoik on the Saturday as well. And we felt it was appropriate, you know, we've got Gala 7s but it's not Kings of the 7s and it's not any points. So we felt it was important to get a second, you know, 15 aside hit out um, so we can look at going at a first more of a first 15 squad against Kelso, against Musselburgh and really start a kind of narrow down selection because it's going to be tough and you know dot the T's, cross the I's and make sure that we're in that position come the 4th of September for going to Riverside. We have been very fortunate, we've got a lot of good experience and we've got some youngsters coming through. You know the, the Thistle coaches over the last two or three years have, have produced really good young players. So it's gave us an opportunity over the last year to work with them but also have that experience of Robert Hogg and the young brothers and, and, and Gary Munro to a certain extent now, who's a, who's an elder statesman. Um, getting getting these players involved with the younger ones has helped them and really brought them on. We had a game against Dalk um, up at Lismore against um, Linlithgow and Curry just on Friday. They were a kind of development team, an under-20s team, and they performed really, really well. Lots of, lots of energy um, and, and just need a wee bit of polishing in there, and they'll be future Jed players for years to come. So yeah, not looking forward to it. Looking forward to the to having that strength and depth. You know that's a, a big thing for us now, uh, and getting the excitement and enjoyment back down at Riverside again. Moving to National One and another three border sides will be competing in that league: Gala, Kelso, and Melrose. And we'll hear from all three now, starting with Kelso vice captain Frankie Robson. I think we're in a pretty good place. I think uh, a lot of the border clubs are similar. We don't have massive big squads like uh, some of the Edinburgh teams, but the boys we've got are really keen, we're really fit, we've been training hard, like we've just talked about, we're itching to go, so um, I think we're, uh, Kelso should be in a good place this year, I think, and uh, look forward to getting into some 15s. We have a vision that we want Gala to be the most successful club team in Scotland, and we want to get them back to that, back to where we believe they belong. Um, and like when you look at the history and the surroundings and everything like that, like the club's steeped in it, so we've got a a real uh, strong belief that we start to build that and it might not be straight away, it might take a few years, but if we can put things in place then that'll hopefully come into fruition. The club's now all under one roof, so like the, the Mini Maroons, the Triangle, the uh, Wanderers, even the Vixens, they're all under the Gala Rugby Umbrella, which is a massive piece of work that Bill undertook during Covid and he managed to get that over the line. And, that's made a massive difference as well. We've now got really good coaches right through. Like we've got Mark McCreef, who you've just seen. We've got Alan uh, Johnston and Tom Weir at the under-18s. And there's loads of coaches right through that gives us a great, a great base and a great structure to develop players from ground up. And then we want a conveyor belt of players coming through Netherdale so that when they come off the back pitches and they come to senior rugby, they're aspiring to be here and then they want to play here. And then if they push on to be further, that's brilliant. We've done our job because it's our job to develop players now we've been planning, we planned right through the pandemic for uh, within the guidelines what we can do, what we couldn't do, just to try and keep the guys uh, you know, engaged uh, with their training. Uh, a lot of guys went away and were really proactive and did their own training, you know, trained within the bubbles and then when the restrictions eased, obviously get more guys uh, back on the pitch. But uh, yet again, it's been difficult. I like to think that we're in a reasonably good stead going forward now with guys, as you see, we've got you know, nearly 50 guys trained tonight, so uh, everybody's, everybody's back and loving the rugby. 
In National 2, the only Borders team is Peebles and they'll hope to celebrate their centenary season with promotion under head coach Lewis Bartram. We've got 23 guys out there tonight that are Peebles High School former pupils. You know, and so that's something that the high school can be really proud of. They've brought these guys through and the, the club's just dead keen to keep guys going. We lose a lot of guys going away to university and we work hard to try and get them when they come back or get them keep coming up and down the road. main thing for us is that if guys enjoy their rugby, they're going to come back to us and that's you know what we've got to work hard to do. One of the unluckiest teams pre-COVID-19 were Berwick, who were poised to win promotion to National League Two. But they've regrouped and are ready to go again with unfinished business to attend to, as head coach Colin Young told me when I went up to meet him at the ground in Scremerston. When you're sitting top of the league with a couple of games to go, uh, the title was in our own hands. Uh, fortunately, we didn't get the celebrations like Big Ed did and so on and get the trophy removed from us. But uh, unfortunately, the season got cut short and we didn't get the, the chance to celebrate. And that will make you just even more determined as a club. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no. Uh, we've all said that these boys just came back a, a year old. Uh, you know, you've still got to remember the average age of them is probably 22, 23 with a few older guys. Uh, you can see that these boys have put on, uh, they've become men in the, the, the absenteeism of a year and they've put on uh, bulk in the right places, we believe. Uh, they've been working hard but on their on their own. Uh, you can definitely see that our fitness is still there. They came back in quite good shape uh, and it's only looking good for the season, fingers crossed. The two reserve leagues involving the A-teams from Hoyk, Melrose, Gala, Jed Forest, Selkirk and Kelso will be competitive, while in the East League, Duns and Hoyk Harlequins will contest Division 1, Hoyk Lindeen and Langham are in Division 2, while Earlston and Gala YM will take part in East League 3. Of course, we must mention that the oldest border club, Langham, become the first team from the south of Scotland to reach their 150th anniversary. And a man who's been 45 years at the club is chairman Kenneth Poole. 31st of December 1871, when uh, three young uh, men who were sons of local manufacturers who were away at public school but were back for their Christmas holidays, uh, decided to invite a whole load of young men from Langham to go and uh, play rugby because they'd obviously been playing at, at their individual schools. Uh, those were men were William Scott and uh, William Lightbody and Alfred Moses and they were the founders of the club, particularly William Scott. Uh, he not only founded the club, he was uh, secretary, he was captain he was every position that they needed at the time he took on but uh, the club then took on some uh, matches local very local matches in 1872 these were really uh, like Langham Old Town versus Langham New Town or Langham versus Cannonby or Langham versus Westerkirk because there was no other um, clubs you know, no other uh, proper rugby clubs in the borders at all at that time. And uh, it wasn't until 1873 when two things happened. Firstly, Langham played Carlisle in what was the world's earliest and world's first rugby match between two diff clubs from two different countries. And then also in 1873, Hoyk was formed. And that gave Langham a chance to go and play Hoyk and Hoyk to come and play Langham. And from there on, other border clubs developed. So that was really the first border derby, Hoyk against Langham? It was, yeah. 1873. 23rd of March, 1873 it was, actually. Oh, you've done your research, uh, Ken. Yeah, it's amazing uh, what now, you can do. 19, I have as well, because 1901 was the formation of the Border League. Five teams involved, including, of course, Langham. So, again, another first for the club. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the founder members of the Border League, obviously. Um, and, you know, uh, things have changed a bit with the Border League and Langham no longer plays matches in the Border League, but uh, we're still a part of the Border League. And uh, our club, with me as uh, representing the club, was uh, president of the Border League uh, two years ago. So we're still very much involved, although uh, we don't play matches now uh, because... 
uh, we would find it very difficult to, to keep up with some of the National League and Premiership teams that are in the Border League. And of course, since rugby went professional, I mean, it has hit a lot of the, the, the clubs like Langham, I suppose, uh, adapting to the, the, the new way of life, of if you like. And, and it means that Langham are now uh, playing their trade down in the East League, East League 2. But obviously there's been some great successes as well. Bailey Donaldson lately, you know, through Hoyk and yeah. came from Langham. Obviously Bomber Hislop playing at a high level now down in England. Good mm -hmm. to see that as well. So there's a lot of, you know, little gold nuggets of success from the club. But obviously you'll be looking as well, you know, into the future and, and wanting Langham to become a national a club again in terms of the league's uh, structure. Yeah. yeah, of course. I mean, we, you know, it's, it's only six years ago that we were really struggling as a club. And uh, it was not only were we finding it difficult to get a team on the pitch, uh, the facilities were, were struggling and that sort of thing. But we made a decision then that what we were going to do was we were going to grow the club from the bottom up. We weren't uh, in the position to start throwing a lot of money about for players from other clubs or anything like that. So we decided that we would develop a good youth structure, which we've done. Uh, we would develop our facilities, which we've done. We've, you know, we've got first class facilities now. Uh, and we've, we've taken the social side of rugby and the community side of rugby and developed that to a very high degree. And we've won awards for that in, in the last couple of years. So we're using our local talent that we're breeding ourselves if you like to shore the club up and start pushing it and pushing it up the leagues and you know the two years before uh, Covid struck we were runners up in in the National League 2 and we were only prevented from getting promotion by changes to the league and to Covid coming in and stopping everything in its tracks basically so you know it's, it will be difficult this season because we've had a long layoff, but we know our ambition's still there. We'll be dipping deeper into Langham's history in a special feature later this month, so look out for that. We'll also keep tabs on semi-junior and schools rugby matters. And on the 28th of August, we hope to bring you highlights of Hoyt Youth versus Jed Thistle and also Gala Wanderers against Kelso Harlequins, a great way to start off the semi-junior season. At the moment, only one Borders team represents women's rugby at national level, Kelso Ladies. But in the near future, we hope they'll be joined by others from the area. And so does Kelso Ladies head coach, Kelly Mitchell. Our aim is to encourage as many girls and women to play rugby so we end up being able to have a Border League derby just like what the men do. And I think that will be an absolute fantastic day when that happens because I'm very confident that that's going to happen. The way the girls games starting to improve in numbers is great. The fact that you know we have about 15 to 20 girls coming down here at under 18s on a Wednesday night um, is absolutely fantastic and I know you know other towns have got the kind of similar. So building that infrastructure around to just keep progressing them through so they've got a team to step up to is the main thing. We lose them, you know, when, when, they, when there's nowhere else to go, they will find something else. So we need to keep a hold of that enthusiasm and that keenness in the sport and get them in. Rugby's not a sport for everyone. and We acknowledge that. But there's a place for everyone in rugby. Whether, you know, whether you're young or old, you know, whether you're experienced or new, give it a shot. Honestly, you'll, you'll absolutely thrive in it. It's great. More over the coming weeks from Kelso Ladies. Well, let's meet another of our team now. During the week, I popped down to have a chat with former Peebles captain and Radio Borders commentator, Dale Clancy. The, the Borders is, the, I would always say, the central hub for rugby in Scotland. It's, uh, you know, it's a very passionate area for rugby and it's, it's, very, it's nice to see it coming back um, after what's been a difficult last few months for everybody. So it's going to be really good to see where clubs are, what they're doing, you know, the, the, the movers and shakers and, and seeing who's kind of moved out of clubs, moved clubs. Uh, so it's going to be really, really interesting. I'm really looking forward to getting back into it. I think, um, you know, the Borders Rugby TV are going to extensively cover all clubs um, throughout the border. So it's going to be really, really interesting to get in amongst them all, see 
um, how all clubs are doing and how they're thriving and, uh, and essentially survived over COVID as well. Now you of course had a fantastic career with Peebles, you were captain of the club as well, you had many, many ups, uh, a few downs <laughs> of course as well, um, probably more downs than ups yes, in fact to yes. be honest, but you enjoyed your rugby of course and, and after you finish it's always difficult to find out well you know you need your rugby fix, what are you going to do next and uh, you know there are options of coaching, there's options of refereeing and of course uh, going into the media as well and, and uh, you've worked with Radio Borders of course quite quite a bit and uh, you're looking forward to a bit of punditry and uh, a bit of commentary as well. Yeah I think uh, my media career has actually been longer than my rugby career so <laughs> uh, so that's that's a bit disheartening but it's it was good actually I think it, as soon as I retired um, because of a couple of knee injuries I got the opportunity to do um, summarising for Radio Borders and it was really good because I, I got to go and see games that as a rugby player on a Saturday you never get to see you never get to go and see uh, Melrose play Gala, you never get to go and see Hoyt play Kelso and you never get to see these derbies um, and these big, you know, higher end matches that you never got to see as a people's player but uh, it, it was really interesting and I think that's as, as it's went on you've, you've probably got a different a, a different passion for rugby now um, I was very kind of club focused and in, internal to people's and um, and now it's, it's been good to see how other clubs operate and, and even to pass on advice to different people because you've got a, a wider perspective of how rugby is in the borders. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, again, I'm very much looking forward to seeing where clubs are, um, seeing the level, the standard. The game's only got more physical over the last, uh, you know, the last five to eight years. So it's going to be really interesting to see where clubs pick off and uh, the, the, where they can go from, from what's been a difficult, as I say, last few months. And our first main commentary game is, is going to be a, a bit of a, a cracker as well at uh, Riverside Park on September the 4th where we've got uh, Jed Forrest playing against Selkirk and, um, well, a cracker to start with. I've, I've covered a few Jed Selkirk games, both at uh, Riverside and Philip Hawk and they're really, really good. They've got, a, they've got now, especially after Super 6, got, they've real, got a real crux of local players throughout um, in both squads. So it's going to be, a, again, a good, a good start and a good test for both teams. So... For a first game of the season, difficult for both of them as well, but then it, it perhaps lay the foundations for what they need to continue with or improve on throughout the rest of the season. So uh, certainly a good one to get started and, and, and launch off uh, Border Rugby TV as well. Well, on our midweek programme, we'll be uh, going round the clubs effectively and we'll be obviously talking to uh, pundits like yourself and uh, Graham Dodds and Graham Hogg as well, who's uh, put his hand up and uh, wants to be involved in this. And I think it's, it's important, isn't it, for ex-players to actually give their opinion and also referees. Yeah, definitely. I think that's one of the one of the great things from the Lions coverage is having Nigel Owens on comms. Uh, it's been really good, um, like, honing into the, the various laws. And, and Graham Dodds, I worked a little bit with Graham Dodds before, pre-COVID, um, and I know Graham Hog for playing against them um, and running with them for uh, a few years. Really good players, um, played to a really, really high standard, far superior to what I ever played at. Um, but it's good because they'll all have different opinions. And I think that what you sometimes see in, in commentary and the media is I think sometimes the opinions get kind of they get guided in a certain direction and you don't really you don't really agree with them or um, or you get frustrated by them but I think the good thing from a player point of view is you're going to you're going to get opinions of from people who you know they've been there they've done it they've been in different environments different squads different cultures um, so that they're they warrant their opinion more than more than most so uh, I'm very much looking forward to seeing what their take is on uh, rugby uh, nowadays when when things get going. One other thing to tell you about, and that's our special Twitter service on a Saturday afternoon, which will bring you latest scores from our Borders teams, as well as other Scottish rugby club matches around the country. The Twitter address for this is simply at Borders Scores, and the information will come to you thick and fast throughout the afternoon. So if you want to know the latest scores as they happen, that's well worth following. Well, I hope that's given you a flavour of what we're up to. I'd like to thank our volunteers and contributors, all very passionate people who will be helping us along the way throughout the season. And also, of course, our sponsors, The Borders Distillery and Samurai Sportswear. We'll be bringing you content every day throughout the season and we hope to bring you the best that Borders Rugby has to offer. <laughs> <laughs>